So look, we got to secure the border, period. No, nope, not as part of a comprehensive bill, not as part of a, a thousand page. The only reason for a thousand page bill is to stack them up there. How are you going to secure it? A couple of things. One, and let me tell you how I know it's secure, then how do we do it? Senate, the Senate's the only place in a, the Congress, I should say, the House know better, the only place in America to tell you, we know we've secured it because we spent all of your money doing it. <laughs> That's not how you know whether it's done. Ask the governors on the border whether it's done. Once they take, because they're the ones that see the consequences firsthand. Look, build the wall. I don't know why this is so complicated, but it's not just building a wall. It's more boots on the ground. It's more of the flare technology. And the, let me tell you what I saw. I went to the border. Last year, over 1,000 unaccompanied kids were sent to our state. <clears throat> Federal government didn't warn us, didn't tell us where they were being sent. All of a sudden, they just showed up. School systems reported we have this influx of kids. Nobody told us they were coming. We didn't budget for them. We didn't hire teachers that speak Spanish. They had to spend millions of dollars coping with this. Nobody warned us. And so I wanted to see for myself, and now it's near 2,000 kids. Last year it was 1,000, now it's near 2,000. So I wanted to go see for myself. I went to the Rio Grande in Texas. Anybody that's ever been there, or if you haven't been there, I'm sure we've all imagined what it was like. I don't know, I imagined there was a wall, there were, I mean, you hear so much about it, I thought, that's got to be pretty tough. I mean, these folks have got to be coming across at night, they've got to be sneaking, that must be tough. Yeah. At least where I was. So when I was there, I saw three groups coming across. Now, I was in marked law enforcement vehicle. I mean, we weren't hiding. We weren't in camouflage, we weren't invisible. We were in a brightly painted boat. We were in a truck, we were in a helicopter. I asked them, we were with local law enforcement, I said, you know, you've got these bold and these stripes. He goes, we want to be seen. We want them to know we're here. We're not trying to hide from them. We saw three groups come across. And on the Texas side, it was sugar cane. On the Mexican side, there were different homes and developments. But on the Texas, so once they got across, once they disappeared in the sugar cane, it was really, really hard to track folks that got across. We saw three groups. One of them just literally waded across the rear ground, which was pretty shallow. Second group floated across. Third group, and this one that really got me. There's a man-made dam between Mexico and Texas right there. And the third, there's a walkway on the top of it, just a little narrow pathway. The third group walks across the top, and there's a fence, a little, you know, a tall fence with a gate. I, they come across the fence, and I think the fence is long. So we've called Border Patrol, so, because, you know, they've got the jurisdiction to come get them. We call Border Patrol, they walk right up to the gate, they swing it open. <laughs> it's not even locked. I'm like, well, what's the point? Is that just for decoration? They just want to make us feel better? And here's the thing that really amazed me. I talked to a Texas law enforcement. They said when they surge people to certain parts of the border, they see the number of illegal crossings drop dramatically. Now, they might go somewhere else, but the point is deterrence works. So they know if they're boots on the ground, if they have the, the, night, the, the heat sensing technology on the helicopters, if they've got folks in boats on the water, they can actually stop people from coming. The reality is we're not trying that. Not in a serious way. And they spent a lot of money, and they had to increase the number. But if we were serious about this, we could get this done. And look, I blame the left. I blame the Democrats for not wanting to enforce law. But I also blame Republicans. I meant what I said. We cannot be the party of big government. We shouldn't be the party of big business either. And I think there are a lot of business interests that want common war. There are a lot of business interests that want amnesty. They want open borders. And as a party, we need to stand up to that. And if the folks in D.C. can't stand up to a fire, if they can't get the job done, let's elect people who can get the job done. So this can be done. It's not hard to do, but I think the way you know it's done, ask the border state governors to tell us after that's done. I think a smart immigration policy says, hey, well, if people make our country stronger, we want them here. And if they don't, we don't. But I can't emphasize enough this assimilation point. I don't think it gets talked about enough. I don't think people focus on it enough. Yeah, we've got to secure the border, absolutely. But folks, we're in real danger. If we let people come here and we say, well, you don't have to adopt our values or speak English, that's nonsense. Look to Europe and look at the problems they're creating for themselves. I meant what I said. Immigration without assimilation, that's an invasion. Why would we let people come? I just don't understand that mindset. If somebody doesn't want to be an American, nobody's making it. Don't let them come in. Who's with me? Nobody's making them come. Yeah. And I guess one of the just fundamental disagreements I have with those protesters, they kept trying to argue with me, well, look, you know, this one's life will get better about and I said that I, I understand I understand why people want to be here. But nobody's entitled to be here. Every country picks and chooses and decides who they let in. And America is a compassionate country, and we're a strong country. But no country can survive for very long if we don't insist that we all have a shared set of values. We have a shared set. Here's the problem. This, I don't think this president believes in American exceptionalism. No. 
your right. He doesn't. Yeah, which is amazing to me that we've got a commander in chief. I think he's the first president who doesn't believe in America. We've had incompetent presidents before. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But they believe the right things. I think part of it is he really doesn't believe, you know, look at his foreign policy. He really believes that if we retreat from the world, that makes it a better place. Not understanding our enemies <coughs> and evil forces will fill that void. Weakness is so provocative in evil. A stronger America is good for America, but it's also good for the rest of the world. Yeah. I just don't think he believes that. It's not, that he does, it's not that he's just incompetent. I just don't think he believes the way that you and I believe. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. I don't, you know, this is something that just maybe you can tell me. But for the last 10, 15 years, we've heard of 12 million illegal aliens. Now, we still hear 12 million illegal aliens. And yet, they say there's millions coming over the border each year. Now, I've only got a high school education, but something don't seem right. <laughs> well, first let me say this. With your high school education, I think you do math a lot better than the president with all of his fancy grades. So, I'd say two things. One, I think you got a bunch of math deniers in D.C. They want to pretend like you can spend more money than you've got. They want to pretend that $18 trillion of debt doesn't mean anything. I suspect that maybe they all took Common Core math and gotten confused. <laughs> <laughs> this is, you know, you're right. Look, when they tell you there are 11, 12 million people, whatever the number they use now here, if they know that, why are they still here? I mean, they don't know. I mean, the honest truth is, when they tell you whatever number, they're guessing, or they're estimating. They call it estimating. I don't think they really know. I don't think they would. I mean, especially if you've got sanctuary cities saying we're not going to find out. We're going to choose not to find out and, and break the federal law. I don't think they know. And that's why, that's why I tell everybody, you can't do anything on immigration until you secure the border. Because if you don't do that first, then who knows how big, in the 80s, we were told by our leaders, let us do a comprehensive approach. We'll do amnesty and we'll secure the border. We'll give a little bit to both sides. Well, Republicans went along, and what did we get? Back then, the numbers were supposed to be a lot smaller than 11, 12 million. Now they're a lot bigger. I can tell you in my state, the 1,000, now 2,000 kids we've seen, and if we don't secure the border, those numbers are only going to grow. So I, agree. I don't think they really know. I mean, I'll, let's be honest. I think it's one of these numbers they just they well, say. It's never changed. That's, yeah, that's right. You know, it's one of those numbers that you know it'll be 11, 12 million until it's not. And then one day says, oh, by the way, now it's you know, pick a new number. But the reality is, we got to secure the border. Or I, I will tell you this: that number is going to keep getting bigger. You don't secure the border more and more, and they're going to come from other places as well. <laughs> not only do we need to secure the border for our immigration policy, we need to do it for national security as well. You were saying about securing the border with fences? Yeah, absolutely. Walls, fences, okay. technology. <laughs> okay. Those fences only go so far, then there's a big gap. They walk around the silly things. Well, that's, but that's the way it is today. No, you're right. But that's why you've got to have, it's got to be a continuous border. And look, I know there are places you're going to have to supplement it with technology. You're not, and people say, oh, well, how are you going to do that? It's a lot cheaper to secure the border than not secure the border. I'd rather spend the money up front on border patrol agents. What Texas's experience shows, if you put the resources there, you can stop people from coming across. They climb them. What, and then you've got somebody there to, to, to arrest them when they come over. If you got somebody there saying, you're not, I mean, look, we're not going to. I winter in Texas. Sure. And I'm right on the border, so I know what's going on. I'm a southerner. I don't blame you for wintering somewhere away from the snow. <laughs> <laughs> I wish I could summer away from not over <laughs> I start saying things like, that. I love Louisiana, but uh, you know that humidity gets pretty hot sometimes. <laughs> no, you're right, but that's what we're trying to do now. But my point is, if we were serious about it, build the wall. Don't have gaps, and then put somebody on the other side of the wall, so if somebody tries to come over, we send them back, we arrest them, we detain them. But this idea that we're just going to leave it, you're right, you can't just, you know, you can't just leave a, an unmonitored wall, or you can't just build part of a wall. I mean, that's like squeezing a balloon, the pressure will go somewhere else. So you've got to supplement it. It may be multiple layers in certain places. And maybe the helicopters as well as boots on the ground and you know, video cameras. But the, the point is this, that deterrence works. The reason people are coming across today, and what we saw with the, the president's policies, we, when the unaccompanied children came, they told us, folks told us the reason they were coming is they thought that the president said if they came, they'd get citizenship or they wouldn't get deported. So, I mean, consequences matter. If people think they can come across, and they're going to come. But if they realize, once the word gets out that, no, they're serious about enforcing the border, I think the people trying will go down dramatically. The numbers, and that's what, yeah, again, the, the law enforcement folks in Texas told us that. They said, when it became too hard to come, people stopped coming, at least in that area. Now, there, they just shifted to another area, because they didn't do it everywhere, but where they did. But if you do it everywhere, you'll have a lot fewer people try. Right now, we've got the opposite problem. Yes, sir. 
I'd like to know where you stand on ISIS. And uh, I, I just believe that uh, I see on TV where they, they uh, blow up a car or something. Well, that was an important person. But I think we have to annihilate the troops that are against us. And um, being a Vietnam veteran, where we lost 60,000 of our own people, of my vengeance. I believe we can do that with technology and not put boots on the ground. So what's your thought? A couple of things. First of all, thank you for your service. I think we should run across the hall. Thank you. And last day, we did a program to honor our veterans. And I, and I want to thank veterans from every generation. I especially want to thank our Vietnam uh, War veterans. Too many of them didn't get that appreciation when they came back, as they should have. And that's, that's to our country's eternal regret and shame. Going back to ISIS. Well, look, first, I think we have to have a commander in chief that speaks to us with moral clarity and honesty. Amen. This president won't do that. He literally will not, he does not like to say radical Islamic terrorism. He asked what you would do, Governor. Well, what I would do is I would hunt them down and kill them. That's what I would do. You can arm the Kurds. You can train the Kurds. He won't do it. You can get the Sunni allies to fight with this. The reality is they were worried about the red line when we didn't enforce that with Syria. Their worry is, well, if we're not in this to win this, if they beat ISIS, they prop up Assad and Iran. That's the enemy of their head. They don't want that. And so we've got to show them. But you look at Turkey and how they've been vacillating about how hard they're going to push against ISIS because they're worried about Assad. So we need to show our Sunni allies we're in this to beat this. The thing I wouldn't do, this president's made this mistake. No, I'm not saying we need ground troops today, but I think this president's made a mistake. He went to Congress and said, give me a three-year deadline and give me a ban on ground troops. I would never tell the enemy what we're going to do or what we're not going to do. Yeah, I think... Go to the generals and say, give me a plan to win, take off the political income. We're not degrading them, we're not containing them. You know, it, it is amazing to me, as commander in chief, I would never send our troops into a fair fight. I want them to dominate any conflict they're in. We gotta stop all that. The reason I think the moral clarity and honesty is important, this president goes to the Pentagon and says it's a generation of people who have to win over their hearts and minds. That kind of mush doesn't work. Mm -hmm. I mean, if Patton and Eisenhower had that attitude in World War II, the French would still be speaking German today. Yeah. And so we've got to understand, he said we're not going to win this conflict with guns. Sometimes it takes guns to kill murdering evil terrorists. We have to kill them there before they come get us here. They are, they, they're coming. Look, they called Ford Hood a, play, a workplace violence incident. I mean, at least Joe Biden had the, the honesty in Chattanooga to talk, call it a jihadist attack. Yeah, yeah. This government still won't be honest with us about the workplace violence. At Fort Hood, what, what the hell is this nonsense? But, and the final thing I'll say. We've got to be willing to, look, forget the political correctness. We've got to be willing to say that Islam's got a problem. Yeah. That problem is radical Islam. And it's not enough to condemn generic acts of violence. We need a president who will say to Muslim leaders, you have to condemn these individuals by name. And say they're not martyrs who are going to enjoy a reward in the afterlife. These murdering terrorist fools are going straight to hell where they belong. We have to understand the conflict that we're in. Now we can beat ISIS because unlike Al-Qaeda, they need a whole land to have a caliphate for their PR. We break their ability to do that. It makes it almost impossible for them to recruit new members and dollars and resources. But this drip, we're trying to be a little bit pregnant now. Every several months, the president sends a few more hundred troops, a few more troops. Give those troops the support, the plan they need to be victorious. That's what the commander in chief owes the troops. Yes, sir, back. What's your interpretation of the 14th Amendment as it relates to birthright? <laughs> so the question was about birthright and the 14th Amendment. Look, bottom line, two things. One, we've got to secure the border. Secondly, there's been all this controversy about anchor babies or... I don't know why we wouldn't say, of course, people who come here illegally, we don't treat them the same as people who come legally. Why is that so hard or why is that offensive? If people aren't coming here legally, that's not the same as people that do come here illegally. I don't believe that people who come here illegally, their children should automatically be U.S. citizens. That's right. To me, that's just possible. Awesome. <laughs> there are lawyers, so those, they're familiar, the 14th Amendment starts off saying, those subject to U.S. jurisdiction. 
And there are lawyers that have said, hey, look, that means the people that are here illegally shouldn't have this, this birthright. Uh, uh, right. And there are others that say, no, the Supreme Court ruled long ago. I'm no attorney. It seems to me the right thing to do is if you're here illegally, you shouldn't have that. And if you have to change the law or the Constitution, change it. If the current uh, Constitution allows it, that's fine with me, too. I mean, it seems to me, subject to the jurisdiction, see, it sounds like that would support an interpretation that you need to be here legally. Regardless, you've got to change the law. If, if the courts say, no, 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 you've got to change the law, you've got to clarify it. I don't know. These attorneys get paid by the word. I mean, it's amazing. They can make everything confusing. <laughs> Bottom line is, if somebody's here illegally, they shouldn't have the same rights as people who are here illegally. And their children should not automatically get U.S. citizenship. And I don't understand why this is complicated. I don't know why people get defensive about this. I don't know why. You know, I, I know that Hillary Clinton has tried to attack Republicans for using this word. I want to see Republicans fight. Why are we apologetic? Why don't we say to Hillary Clinton, start calling those, like I said in those videos, call them babies. They're not fetal tissue. Why don't we turn this on them? Why are we so afraid to stand our ground? Now we got Republicans apologizing, coming up with you or changing their position. <laughs> This is simple. I mean, either the law means something or it doesn't. Yeah. And why in the world wouldn't we want to discourage people from coming here illegally? If we can say, we'll take away one more incentive for people to come here illegally, let's do it. Why not encourage people to follow the law? I mean, I've got three young kids. You know, and we treat, we teach our children at home, we're a nation of laws. And if I'm the governor of a state, if I don't like the law, I don't take it for it. I don't get to just wake up every day and say, all right, I'm going to do this law, and not, I'm not going to follow this law. There are consequences to that. I took an oath of office to uphold the constitutional laws of my state and my country. The president took an oath of office to uphold the constitutional laws of the United States. Not some other country, by the way. I'm tired of the Supreme Court looking at international precedent or other countries. They can't follow the U.S. Constitution. I mean, they can't handle one. Why are they reading others? <laughs> and, you know, I worry about that. This is not the first president to disagree with Congress. He's the first one I can remember that so consistently just goes around them and ignores them. Yeah. Whether it's amnesty or Obamacare, I don't want to see a Republican president do that. I don't want to see a Republican president ignore the laws, even if it's a president that I like, who, whose, whose policies I like or admire. We're a nation of laws. I, I talk, we had an earlier town hall. I told folks there, there used to be a cartoon when I was a kid. I'm old enough, I remember, they, where they talked about how a bill becomes a law on Capitol Hill. Do you remember? <laughs> I think we should get that and play that for the president and the members of Congress. They <laughs> <laughs> apparently didn't see that. Um, one of the things that's occurring in our country is there's a division in regard to our Second Amendment rights, which are very clear in the Second Amendment. My question is, right now, Hillary and Obama and, and a lot of them are agreeing with this and are about to sign off our sovereignty to have the United Nations rule whether we have weapons or not. Do they realize that that will cause a civil war? Well, look, I'll tell you a couple of things. One, I'm not for giving one ounce of America's sovereignty to the United Nations or any other international body, period. I mean, that just makes, and again, we, as the president, you uphold, you swear, I don't uphold the United States Constitution and laws, the first obligation the Constitution gives to the federal government is to protect us. Now, this federal government is doing all kinds of things other than its solemn <coughs> obligation. And I don't, one of the things, and I'll get back to the Second Amendment, this president signed, you know, he does a deal with China where we have to hurt our economy in the short term. We have to cut CO2 down. They don't have to do anything until the long term. It's not even enforceable. What kind of deal is that? Why are we hurting our economy? This whole idea that we'll give away America's interest or rights to international bodies makes no sense to me. It shouldn't be done, and no president should do that, and no politician should support any politician that says that shouldn't get another vote and should be kicked out of office, regardless of their other policies, quite frankly. When it comes to the Second Amendment, in Louisiana, we amended our state constitution to put the strongest protections, our own Second Amendment in the state constitution, saying that any restriction on gun owners' rights has to pass strict scrutiny by the courts. And let me tell you, I got an award from the NRA, the highest legislative award, for my time in Congress. You may, we're marking the 10th anniversary of Katrina next week. After Katrina, in the days immediately afterwards, folks, government went door to door, taking away guns from law-abiding citizens. It's not a story that enough people know. If you want to see some, some videos about this, go online to the NRA's website. It's, you'll just be shocked this happened in America. There was an older woman who came, they came into her home, they knocked her to the ground. She was in her own, own home. She went in the street, she wasn't bothering anybody, they took her gun away. 
Well, that's the point. And so they, they were going door to door. They were going door to door. And they, they, a few days later, shortly thereafter, she was victimized. She was robbed because she couldn't defend herself. And so I passed a law in Congress saying this must never happen again. They shouldn't have been able to do it under the Second Amendment. But I passed a law in Congress to make sure they could never do that. That no, that could never happen again. They used their justification was that in a time of a, an emergency and disaster, they had extraordinary powers. But I passed a law saying that could never happen again. I, I tell you that. I tell you quickly, and it's a chilling. Video. I mean, when you watch that video, you will swear that could never happen in America. You'd swear that never happen could happen in Louisiana or New York, but it did. It didn't happen in some other country. It happened here. And so anytime somebody tells you, oh, the government's not going to do that, tell them to go watch these videos. It's not theory. It's not hypothetical. It happened. I'll tell you just real quickly, though. So Wayne LaPierre, I'm, I'm a freshman member of Congress. And Wayne LaPierre says that he wants to come and congratulate in person, wants to come to my district, come to Louisiana, and thank me for passing this law. It was a big deal for the NRA. It's one of their top priorities. Well, folks, when you're, when you're a freshman, when you have Wayne LaPierre, that's a big deal coming to your district. So we were on the August recess, and I will remember this forever. It was 2006. It was the year after Katrina. Katrina was in 2005. And I remember it was my second year, my first term of Congress. I went to my wife, who we've now been married 18 years, and I said the dumbest thing I've said to her in 18 years of marriage. <laughs> my wife was pregnant with our third child. And so I went to her and said, now look, Wayne LaPierre is coming on August 16th. I said, we can have this baby any day. <laughs> Slade Ryan Jindal was born at about 2.30 in the morning, August 15th, at home. <laughs> First baby, 36 hours of labor. Second baby, 24 hours of labor. Third baby, 30 minutes of labor. <laughs> I wasn't playing, by the way. And for about a millionth of a second, I thought in my mind, I didn't say this, I thought in my mind I would ask my wife if I could still go. <laughs> but then I realized I like being married, I like being alive, so I didn't do that. <laughs> Wayne Mafia, he understood, he rescheduled. Look, our Second Amendment rights, what I, the, the left, they love to invent rights that aren't in the Constitution. They make things up that aren't there. This is plain black letter law. If they don't like it, they should try to change the Constitution. I'd fight them on it, but at least that's a more honest approach. If they don't want law-abiding citizens to have guns, they should change the Constitution. They should stop trying to take it away or give away uh, our rights. But, you know, they just don't trust us. Let's be honest. They don't want us to have First or Second or Tenth Amendment rights. The left doesn't think we're smart enough to live our own lives. Agriculture has always been a strong backbone for the American economy. Sure. With all the illegals and the ISIS coming in this country, how do we secure our food and water supplies? It's a great question. So. You know, the first, let's talk about a couple of things. In terms of the food we import today, not enough of that is actually inspected, and, and we don't do enough. It's one of the reasons I think it's important America is able to continue to feed ourselves. We've historically fed ourselves and, and other countries as well. So one, just in terms of the food we import, but I think your question is more about the food that's here and our water supplies. There are two things we've got to do. The one is that we've got to harden our infrastructure. What does that mean? I want to shrink government, but I also want to make sure that it's doing its core job to protect us. And we don't do nearly enough against these asymmetrical attacks, whether it be the water systems, whether it be cyber attacks, whether it be bioterrorism. Look, the next attack may not look exactly like the last one. And I think we are least prepared, maybe an EMP attack, we're not, we're least defended against some of these asymmetrical attacks. And I think that the hollowing out of the military makes that worse. But here's the second thing we got to do. Playing defense isn't enough. Playing defense means you've got to be perfect every time. We've got to go on offense and go after those that seek to do us harm. So here's the problem. The Chinese, they came and we, everybody knows, but we won't say it, but everybody knows they came into this cyber attack and took all these government records. Our president doesn't stand up to folks who come after us. What message does that send to the next bad actor? And the next bad actor may not be a national group. It may be an a, a, a subnational group. But in addition to hardening our infrastructure, we've got to go on offense. Folks need to know that you can't just harm America. What they've learned in these last seven years is the opposite of that. I remember what I said. So in trying to negotiate a bad deal, with, trying to defend a bad deal with Iran, this president admitted his failure to control spending meant that he couldn't get China to put sanctions on Iran. I want you to think about it just for a second. The commander in chief says, I can't get China to put sanctions on Iran, so I can't get a good deal because I need them to buy our government debt. 
we are spending so much that we need them to buy our debt, so I don't have leverage with China. And what kind of that, that to me, it's almost immoral to create that kind of weakness for America, that kind of dependence for America. So yeah, we've got to harden our infrastructure, but even as important, we've got to go on offense. We have to go disrupt those that seek to do us harm and make sure that those that have tried it suffer consequences so that they know not to do that again. I fear the lesson, it's going to take time to repair the damage he's done. I think the lesson people have internalized is, look, if, you, if you're mean to America, you'll get what you want. Look at the dictators in Cuba. Look at Iran. And then you compare how we treat Netanyahu and Israel. You try to be our friend, we kick you. You walk all over us, we'll give you whatever we want. Any child on a schoolyard will tell you that's not how you deal with bullies. So I worry we're encouraging people who want to do us harm. Yes. All right. I got four kids that are high school up through college, and it seems like we're doing a lot to put them behind the eight wall. We're setting them up with all this debt, and then we're making it to where they're in the hardest area of uh, the sector of the economy to be able to employ. And they're all going to be going to college, and they're looking at like an inability of being able to get jobs, and they're going to be stuck with all this debt. What? We do differently. I think first. Well, first off, let me applaud your shirt. I think you've got the best shirt on, Dave. You, you want to try me? We're making more shirts. That's right. I want to ask you if it's authentic. Like, if you really have it. No, no, no. My wife actually got it online for me. Well, I'm it. But look, I think that's exactly right. He talked about his four kids. I got three kids, and you're right. Every generation of Americans has left more opportunities than what we inherited from our parents. Every generation. I don't think we want to be the first that mortgages our children's future. The debt you're talking about, let's be honest. When they talk about printing money or they talk about you know, borrowing money, let's be really honest with what we're doing. The TV ad I wish Mitt Romney had run was this. I wish he had shown a child sleeping in her bed at night with a piggy bank on her dresser, like most of our kids have, a young girl. And then have these two adults come into the bedroom, sneak in the bedroom, break open the piggy bank, and take the money out of the piggy bank. And then the camera backs up and you show them going to the living room and it's the parents throwing a pizza party with that money. That's what we're doing. You know, forget $18 trillion, forget percentages of GDP, forget foreign debt. What we're doing is we're robbing from our children to pay for a government we don't need and we can't afford. It's a set, to me, that's immoral. The president trying to make a moral case for Obamacare, I think it's immoral to make people dependent on government. Immoral to spend money we don't have. Immoral to take from our children. So how do we change that? Well, one, we have to grow the real world economy. You shrink the government, lower flatter tax rates, take away power from the IRS. Energy independence. Now, that means all forms of energy. We have more, we have more available energy. We can be a superpower. We can be energy independent, but the EPA and the government has to get out of the way. This president goes to Congress and he brags about increasing oil and gas production, even though it's decreasing on federal lands and waters. It's like the rooster taking credit for the sun coming up. I mean, he had nothing to do with it. He's just he's bragging about what's going on in the private sector, not the government sector. You've got the EPA with these CO2, these ozone, these water rules, trying to strangle our economy. We've been punching below our weight. 2% economic growth, that's not a recovery. You look at all the people that have dropped out of the workforce. You're right, young kids, young graduates, some of the lowest underemployment, unemployment, some of the highest underemployment, unemployment, lowest employment rates we've seen in a long time. You look at the student debt we're crushing them with, a trillion dollars. Their incomes aren't going up, yet tuition is. So what do they do? The government has a monopoly on student loans. They snuck that in with Obamacare, by the way. So students, they pay 6 7% interest rates. Anybody earning 6 7% on your savings account at the back? <laughs> I'd like to find out. I'd like to put my money there. But they can't get their debt refinanced. So if you had competition between credit unions and banks, Maybe we could have better refinancing terms for our students. Break up the accreditation monopolies so you have more competition in higher education. Students should be able to get credits for life experiences, online learning, mix and match credits from different places. So maybe it would be cheaper to get their, their Let them start their training in high school. Let them get technical training even before they go to college, before they go to, to school after high school. I think that there are things we do at the state level. We've got a TOPS program. Kids in Louisiana, if you have a 20 ACT or and a, a 2.5 GPA in high school on, on certain courses, we'll pay for your tuition. We're, a, we're one of the 10 best states in terms of the portion of kids with debt and in terms of uh, how much that debt is. We've got one of the lowest tuition rates. My point is, there are things we can do to get the American dream back. Here's what we can't do. If some politician gets up and tells you, I'm going to make the government the answer to your child's problems, they're lying. 
would that be honest? Look, that, in this election, it really boils down to one of the essential questions is do we really believe government is the answer to all of our problems? Do we really believe that if we just spent a little bit more, things would be better? If we just borrowed a little bit more, if we just had a few more people getting a few more free things from government, that's what Hillary Clinton's trying to sell us. We've got to be honest with our kids. We've got to be honest with our kids and say, look, no one's going to give you everything for free, but we'll give you the opportunity to work. We'll give you an opportunity to get a great education. And if you do that, the great thing about this country is there's no limit on what you can accomplish. Here's the difference between two men. My, you know, my dad grew up poor. I did. My dad did. When the president sees somebody who's successful, he criticizes them. He says they won the lottery. He says they didn't build that. Yes. When my dad, when he saw somebody that was successful, he'd bring my brother and me to see that car or that house and say, look, if you worked hard, you could live like this too. There's nobody that's going to stop you. He would never tell us, oh, that person stole from us or did something wrong to us. You know, here's the, I told you about when I was born, my dad paid the doctor every month. There was a charity hospital down the street. Could have gone there for free. State operated a network of charity hospitals. Oh, they're okay along the back bridge. Was that that? He did go. My mom did go. When I was old enough, I asked him, why didn't y'all go there? Instead of paying the doctor every month, I mean, that's a great story, Dad, but why didn't you go to the charity? Why didn't you go to the free hospital? And I love his answer. He said, that wasn't for us. He said, that's for people who really needed help. Look, my parents didn't buy their first house when I was seven years old. We were never poor. We always had food to eat. We had clothes to wear. I didn't have everything I wanted. I had everything I needed. I had parents that loved me. Also, by the way, I had parents that spanked me. That's a whole different story. <laughs> as, as, grandparents, as grandparents, they call that, you know, they won't let me spank their grandchildren. They say, oh, no, that's cruelty. I said, wait a minute. What happened? I remember when I was a child, my dad says to me with a straight face, we never spanked you. <laughs> For a guy from my entire childhood, it's amazing. <laughs> my mom's more honest. My mom says, you can spank him, just don't spank him in front of me. I, mean, I know you can spank him, I just want to see him. I don't understand that either. But here's the thing about when, when we were growing up. You know what our parents taught us? My dad, my mom, they didn't buy that first house when we were seven because they saved. You didn't buy things you couldn't afford. You didn't think somebody, well, I never once heard them complain, hey, how come somebody didn't give us a house? Somebody owes us this. That's just not what we did. And we didn't complain about, you know, we didn't have, we didn't have the fanciest things, but we had what we needed. We've got to get back. I think one of the most important things that's at stake in this election is the culture. It's our values. Mm -hmm. Definition of the American dream. You can change tax rates and regulations and spending rates. I give the president this much credit. They're pretty smart at what they're trying to do. You change the idea of America. We let the idea of America slip away. Four years from now, children will only be reading about the America that we grew up in. They won't recognize it anymore. You want our future to be Europe? Let's go down that path. So I agree with you. Your children, look, my children, one day they will look back to this moment and say one of two things about us. They'll say, thank God my parents did what needed to be done. Or they'll wonder, I wonder where our parents were. Why did they care enough about us to fight for us? Previous generations have spilled great blood and treasure to give us these freedoms. This is our moment of choosing. What are we willing to do for our children? What are we willing to sacrifice? Look, I wouldn't be here today if my parents hadn't given up everything they knew to pursue a better life. The least I can do is give everything I've got for my three kids and for your four kids and all of our children. So you're exactly right. That's what this election's about. Governor, we have time for one more. Yes, sir. You hear about the Social Security program not having enough money, but you never hear about welfare running out of money. <laughs> That's, <laughs> the deal. That's a great question. And so, well, look, a couple of things. Let's talk about welfare. In the 90s, they did welfare reform on a bipartisan basis. What that meant was Republicans kept passing it, Clinton kept veto on it, and he finally gave up. So it was bipartisan. And what they did was they said, we're going to make welfare temporary, and we're going to put accountability. Meaning if you got welfare, you had to work, or you had to look for work, or get an education, you had to go do something. You couldn't just get a job. Now, the liberals said it was the worst thing in the world. They predicted people are going to starve in the street. This was the end of humanity and civilization, as you know. 
And then a funny thing happened. Largest drop in poverty and teenage pregnancy rates we've ever seen. So what did they do? You had such a successful program, they must have built on it. Well, no, this is DC. <laughs> so under this president, they weakened the work departments. They weakened the accountability. And the second thing, they didn't finish the job in the 90s. They didn't apply it to every program. They didn't apply it to Medicaid. They didn't. Instead, Obamacare just expands Medicaid to able-bodied adults. And so, to get back to the, the reforms of welfare, we need to do two things. The next president needs to put back in the accountability. Stop waiving all the work requirements. There needs to be accountability. Yeah, there should be welfare as a temporary help to people who really do need it. But it needs to be temporary and with accountability. It doesn't need to become a lifestyle. And one of the things we also have to remember as a country is government should be the first, second, and every answer to every problem. What do I mean by that? The Founding Fathers envisioned vibrant organizations in the civil structure apart from government. Family, faith, churches, not-for-profit groups. They envisioned these vibrant intermediaries between the individual and government. Now, the left has done a lot to weaken those institutions. And the result is that more and more people are dependent on government. Government's not the first, second, and last answer to every problem. There is a role for temporary welfare for that safety net for those who absolutely need it. But I think it is harmful both, you know, I'm going to say this, and this is an important point. Socialism is not just bad for taxpayers. Welfare and government dependence is not just bad for people like you and me. It's also bad for the people that it pretends to help. I think it is better it is better for taxpayers, certainly, for people to, to have the dignity of work and self-sufficiency. But I also think it's better for them, for those individuals. I think there is honor in work. I think it is good for the, the human soul and spirit. I, I don't think it's just a matter that it saves money for taxpayers. It's good that it saves money for taxpayers. I'm not saying that's a bad thing. But as conservatives, we need to stand up and say, wait a minute, socialism and dependency is bad for the people you say you're trying to help. I'll tell you real quick, we did school choice in Louisiana. There was a school in New Orleans East, a parochial school. And this was a neighborhood that was hit hard by Katrina. It's north of the Ninth Ward. And there was there, there were a lot of kids that were there on scholarships. And I met one of the moms there, and she told me her story. She said her mom was pregnant as a teenager, went on welfare and got her. This mom that came said she herself was pregnant as a teenager, went on welfare, had her daughter. Now, she was there at the school with her daughter, and she told me her story. She said she was working three jobs to keep her daughter in the school. She goes, I'm not Catholic, but I wanted my girl to go to this school because I figured they'd teach her values and discipline. And she had tears in her eyes, and she told me that her daughter was, for the first time, bringing home homework, for the first time thinking about staying in school past high school, for the first time there was toilet paper in the bathrooms, pen and paper in her classroom. But what was so powerful to me was that this mom wanted the American dream for her daughter. She was basically saying to me, I don't want her to make the mistakes I made. That this needs to end in our family. Now she comes from a household, she comes from a neighborhood, I'll be honest with you, probably vote, that neighborhood probably votes 99.9% .9 Democrat. She probably didn't vote for me. If she voted for me, it was by mistake. They hit the wrong button. <laughs> But that, gave, that gives me encouragement and hope. It's never too late. We should never give up on the American dream. We should never say, well, if as Republicans and conservatives, we accept that once the left sets a certain level of government dependence, we can never go below that, we're done. And that what makes me so mad about, when you hear Republicans or conservatives tell you, well, it's not politically viable. That is code words for saying, we don't want to fight. When they say, well, it's not politically viable, now that Obamacare is low, the, the, in, the, in effect, it's not politically viable unless we match his subsidies. That means we don't want to fight. When they tell you it's not politically viable to secure the border, that means we don't want to fight. When they tell you it's not politically viable to defund Planned Parenthood, that means they don't want to fight. When they tell you it's not politically viable to do term limits, that means they don't want to fight. And we need to tell them, if you don't want to fight, go home. Yeah. All right. Close with this. So look, I know not everybody got to ask their question. I'm going to stay right here as long as folks want to visit. So if you want to come and ask a question, take your picture, tell me whatever you want. I'll be happy to do that. Let me close with this. The idea of America is what's at stake here. 
This election is not about one-liners. It's not about who can give the funniest speech. It is about saving the idea of America. I've got the backbone. I've got the bandwidth. I've got the experience to get this done. I want to go to fight for you, for me, for our families. But I can't do it alone. If you will join with me, with the grace of God, I know that we can't be stopped. And I know we must get this done. So don't wait till tomorrow. we got folks here. Sign up with us. Join our cause. The moment we start taking our country back starts right now. And we're not going to rest until we have won. God bless you all. And thank you all.